And um, the goal for tonight is really to provide education and information for you. Um, we're not here to scare you or to deter you, but um, to answer questions that you have and to make this an interactive process where um, you leave here with resources and information that can be helpful, not just for you and your family, but also for our community. So here is our agenda for today. Um, I thought that it's important for us to talk about um, what substance abuse is initially and what is addiction before we move forward and talk about the other things. Um, I also just realized I need to say it's okay to record <laughs> for um, Javier. Um, so let me just start from the beginning, sorry. Um, so our agenda for today is um, to start by talking about what substance abuse is, what is addiction. Um, I'll move then to talk a little bit about some statistics um, that we have and um, then move to talk about signs and symptoms um, of addiction and what you should be looking out for. Um, we will then talk about the fentanyl crisis, um, also talk to you a little bit about xylazine. Um, we have some information about that, um, definitely not as much as we have on fentanyl. Um, then we'll talk about the dangers of social media and you know how easy it is to obtain illicit drugs. And we have a few cases um, where our um, Glendale Police Department was actually involved and can share some of those per, uh, personal stories. Um, in the back, um, I don't know if everyone signed in, but we have resources for you to take home. Um, and there's also drug information cards on the tables um, with our contact information. So definitely feel free to take them. Um, and I'll try to... Oh, right. Uh, there's also uh, actual drug paraphernalia on the table, so do not take that with you. That's only for display. Thank you. Um, so feel free to ask questions as we uh, go along. And then at the end, um, we have a slide on resources, so feel free to take a picture of that if you need to. Um, there's a lot of good information. So first, um, I, let me ask any uh, you guys here if um, you've heard about the Substance Abuse and Wellness Resource Program with the Glentel PD. Does anyone know what the program is or have you heard it? Yeah, no, okay. Well, yeah, so just briefly, uh, the program started um, because we want to address what's happening in our community related to addiction and substance abuse. So we're part of the Community um, Outreach Resources and Engagement Bureau, the C core bureau of Glendale PD. Um, and really we serve as a hub um, for um, people who, are, uh, who get arrested um, with any narcotics charges, but are willing to get help and need resources. So. Um, I will follow up with them, make an assessment, and see what the appropriate level of care is for them to refer them out to um, services. So um, what is addiction? Um, this is the you know, uh, DSM definition of what addiction is. We know that it's chronic. We know that it's a, a brain illness, and it does have... Um, long-lasting changes that can impact the, our brain function. So um, usually when we think about addiction, different people have different definitions of it. Um, sometimes people will say that, uh, you know, I'm only drinking once a week so I don't have an addiction or I haven't had a blackout or I haven't had anything with law enforcement um, so I'm not an addict. But you don't need to have all of that to be uh, dependent on any substances. And you'll see as we move forward. So, um, so 
So addiction is a chronic medical disease. It's a relapsing and remitting disease of the brain, and it causes compulsive drug seeking and use, um, even though we have negative consequences, right? So when you think about um, addiction, you can think of the four C's. Um, you can think about impaired control, right? You don't have the ability to stop on your own that there's compulsive use, um, again, despite negative consequences, um, and you continue to use it even if you're trying not to use it, um, and you have cravings. So the, the four C's are a good way to remember um, what addiction is. Um, let me ask the audience here, how many... Um, how do you define addiction, or how does your culture define addiction? I know in some cultures, people view it as a moral failure or, you know, like a weakness. What do you, what, what's one way you guys have heard about addiction? There's no shame in it. You can share. Has anyone heard that it's a moral failure? Yeah. For the Hispanic community, right. That if you're, if you're strong enough, you'll stop, right? Mm. What else have you heard? <laughs> or... Everybody drinks, we should drink, it's okay, it's not as bad. That, yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Oh. Right. Right, right, right. Yeah, of course, it's not every family. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. 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 Oh, okay. Congratulations. Right. Right. Of course. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, right. Of, I wholeheartedly agree with you, right. And you'll see we have a very short video that explains what drugs do to the reward um, system of our brain and why the cravings happen, how we build tolerance, why people need to use more over time to get the same effect. So um, I'm going to leave that for the video so that we can be mindful of the time. Oh, I didn't see you. Yes. Right. Right. It's a caffeine addiction. Right. Right. Video game. Right. Right. No, no. And you'll see. Um, so, yes, uh, video games can be an addiction. Eating, right? Everything. It, it's that same reward circuit. But... When we think about uh, addiction with illicit drugs or alcohol or marijuana, right, the negative consequences of that versus what happens when we drink coffee too much, if we have heart palpitations or you get anxious, there, it, it's on a continuum, right, of what's a bit more tolerable. So, yes. Right, and yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. 
Right. 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 Right, right. Right. So the functional addict is somebody who has uh, the disease but is able to maintain their day-to-day -day life. So a lot of times individuals who do who are in that phase tend to deny that they really have a problem because they can rationalize with saying, you know, I'm working, I'm making money, I am uh, I still have a roof over my head, so it's not that big of a deal. Here you'll see, I don't know if you can see, but so in order to be diagnosed with addiction, there's there are 11 criteria. And you only need two or more of these within a 12-month course for you to have this diagnosis. So if you have two to three of these, uh, it's mild. If it's four to five, it's moderate. And then six or more, um, it's severe. But you'll see the uh, categories, you know, it doesn't say you have to be drinking once a month or anything like that. But, you know, unsuccessful efforts to cut down or quit. Most people have that. That's a, a pretty common one. Or a lot of time spent getting to your drug of choice. A lot of lying, a lot of manipulating, right? A lot of resources. So this is just a quick snapshot of what substance use disorder is. So here is the, we're gonna play the video. It's a two to three minute video of, and it does a really good job explaining what addiction is and what it does to our brain. Addiction is defined as not having control over doing, taking, using something to the point where it could be harmful to you. Previous to understanding science, it was thought that addiction resulted from a lack of willpower and was a moral failing. But we now know that addiction is a physiological disease. It changes the brain structure in ways that can alter the way it works and process information. To understand how that happens, we start by thinking about reward and the brain's natural reward system. The reward pathway's primary function is to reinforce sets of behaviors. Evolutionarily, it began as a way to indicate to us that actions that help us survive are good and we should keep doing them. This is mediated through a chemical called dopamine. Following an appropriate behavior, the reward pathway releases a small burst of dopamine. That burst of dopamine is a satisfying jolt encouraging you to repeat the same action in the future. Dopamine will in turn also act on areas responsible for memory and movement, which helps us automatically build up memories for what is good for survival. The problem is that addictive substances hijack our natural reward system. Every substance has slightly different actions on the brain. But one thing all addictive drugs have in common is that they produce a pleasurable surge of dopamine. Addictive drugs all cause dopamine to flood the reward pathway 10 times higher than a natural reward would. Over chronic use, nothing else natural is quite as rewarding. In fact, as substance use increases, the circuits adapt and reduce their sensitivity to dopamine, a phenomenon known as tolerance. For example, let's say a person takes cocaine for the first time. The reward system receives a huge burst of dopamine. But as the person takes more, more frequently, cocaine will be overstimulating the brain with dopamine. This will cause the brain to adapt to these chronically high levels of dopamine. To compensate and adapt to this new normal, the brain reduces the number of dopamine receptors available in the reward system and releases less dopamine. As a result, that person will feel the need to increase the amount of drug they take so that they can reach the level of high that they're used to. But it's not just the reward system that's affected by this tolerance. 
since dopamine is also involved in other brain mechanisms. Other brain regions involving decision-making, memory, and judgment also get physically disrupted as a result. The overall effect is to have drug-seeking behavior driven by habit rather than conscious thought, like a reflex instead of a choice. This biological basis helps to explain why addiction really is a brain disease, not a matter of willpower. The stigma that accompanies addiction only makes seeking treatment more difficult. Thoughts? Comments about the video? Yes. So the question was if addiction is hereditary. Um, I don't, it's not the whether I agree or not, but it's always, you know, genetics and environment, you know. So it, I, it's not one or the other. Um, so it's both. It's genetics and environment. It's Right. Uh-huh. Yeah, so your question had a few parts. Um, th there are families, right, where you have both parents who have uh, uh, substance use disorder, and none of their kids have addiction. Um, and then there are parents who have never drink in their home, but their kids end up um, um, with the disease. So, um, you know, it, it's not black and white. There are multiple factors that contribute to it. Um, and then you said, what can be done to prevent that? Again, it's not one thing. So definitely communicating to your kids about what um, addiction can to do to their brain, having, uh, you know, being present in their life, being mindful of what they're doing, uh, engaging them in a lot of extracurricular activities. You know, again, it doesn't mean that if you do all those things, it's not going to happen, right? And also, there are some people who will argue and say, you know, I can smoke weed once and nothing will happen. Um, and then there are others who start smoking and, you know, it develops into um, substance use disorder. Um, you don't know, so um, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Guillermo. Hi, my, my name is Guillermo Jimenez. I'm a detective with the city of Glendale, uh, vice narcotics detail. And to uh, just kind of add to your question, I come from uh, a family where my my father was <clears throat> a drug addict and an alcoholic. Um, he died in 2012, still being an alcoholic and, and a drug addict. And uh, growing up, um, I was uh, I, I saw a lot of things that. A child shouldn't see you know I seen him use drugs um, I remember one specific time where he took me in um, to purchase narcotics and I saw what it did to my to my family like again he was um, at first you know I've had, I've had when he was alive I'd had deep conversations with him and asked him why how did he get into it and um, uh, why he does it and he was very honest with me and um, you know he started back in with marijuana then drinking alcohol and then in the 80s, he was introduced to crack cocaine, and um, that was probably the, the the worst mistake he ever did is to to try that. And he was a, a functioning a functioning addict at, to a certain point, um, but there was a there was a time where um, he the, the drug just o took over his life. He was missing work, calling out, um, gone for uh, you know, like days at a time. It put a strain on the the. Uh, the marriage with my with my mother they ultimately they ended up divorcing and it got into you know something you know like financial troubles um so but my it goes my mom was and to to answer your question yeah i i i could say that i was there exposed to it and could have easily um did what he did he did what he um did um just because of the 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 neighborhood i was involved in um where i where i grew up it was a lot of gangs, there was drugs. Um, so I could have easily went to that path, but 
I, as I look back and I grow, I'm older now, obviously, uh, I, I can't thank my mother enough for just being present with me, loving me, supporting me in everything I do, putting me in sports, um, just talking to me, being honest with me. And then also, too, like I, I can't really thank enough is my uncles. I have four uncles that were in my life. And when I was a young kid, I never, I, I didn't, re, I just thought nothing of it. They were being nice to me. They were taking me to baseball games, um, uh, football games, um, off-roading events. They'd take me fishing. They'd take me hiking, uh, they, uh, shooting up in the, in, in, the, in, in the mountains. And I thought, hey, they're just being nice. They're, they they want to help me. But now that I'm older and growing up, they're, they were being in my life, being a, being a, a role model, being present and taking me out of what they knew I was being exposed to and, and, and the lack of my, my father being there. So um, I think that um, just obviously having um, a, an honest relationship with your kids and with, with people and being transparent, uh, being involved and um, doing all those extracurricular activities helped me. And that's something that, that I take and I want to do with my, my children. Obviously, I'm, um, you can say I'm not, uh, like I'm not an addict. I, obviously, uh, I do ha enjoy an alcoholic beverage I I on the weekend socially. But, again, it's, not, it's, it's a whole lot of things. And it's not pinpoint, but that's just what I look back and what helped me um, and what I'm going to take uh, to give back to my kids. So I just wanted to. Yes. <laughs> I don't know that it's that black and white, you know. Yes, uh, a lot of people can have that predisposition, like, you know, have um, the genetic makeup um, for it, but um, it, it's not very black and white. So I, I can't answer your question definitively because it might happen, it might not, you know. Um, some of us can have a glass of wine and end it, right? Um, but others start drinking and then you know, it develops into alcoholism. You know, I'm sure we all know, you know, Amy Winehouse, what happened to her, right? She, she didn't start out as an alcoholic. She was drinking, you know, um, with her family, but she died of alcohol poisoning, right? So she, she, her tolerance level was so high she was drinking so much. And then she finally went into recovery um, and had some sobriety and uh, recovery under her belt. And then she relapsed. But that relap relapse cost her her life because of alcohol poisoning. So I don't think there's a definite answer to say, you know, if you have this, you won't get that. I think if it was like that, we wouldn't be seeing a lot as many deaths and overdoses. Yeah. Um, all right. So this is um, a map of the overdose rates in the United States. You can see that in 1999, we had approximately 16,000 deaths, and it's um, overdose deaths per 100,000 people. And then look where we're at in 2014. And then look where we are in 2023. So um, we definitely need to be talking about this because um, it's happening all across the nation and it's happening here as well. Okay, so uh, again, I, I reintroduced myself. I'm Guillermo Jimenez, detective with the uh, City of Glendale Vice Narcotics Detail. I have about uh, nine and a half years um, with, uh, with the detail. I've been a police officer here for 19 years. So um, I've, been, I've seen a lot here in Glendale, the, 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 the highs as far as like with all of the, the drugs that are been relevant here in Glendale. 
um, what's currently being used now and what is not being used and what was used back when I first started. So it, just to let you know, like I said, narcotics are here in Glendale. Um, they're being used. They're being um, they're being used and they're being sold here. I'm mean, not. And I'm not saying that just to scare you. I just to make you aware that it's it's out there, you know. And it's it's you know it's being our kids, our 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 our, our community is being exposed to this. Um, and just to come a couple of little statistics here. Um, back in when I when I came back to the to the detail uh, during just after COVID into 2021. That's when we started seeing a very up, uh, high uptick in uh, fentanyl overdoses, and it had a lot to do with obviously COVID people uh, being um, secluded into their homes, not being able to come out. And um, so, in, in 2021, we had approximately 193 overdoses. Not all overdoses result in deaths. Um, some, a lot of those are are overdoses where obviously they. Um, the, uh, medical service they used, they called and summoned to medical services and were revived. Some of them did result in death. And then uh, 2021, we had uh, 250, um, 250 in 2022. And, and I could say that in 2023, we've seen uh, the numbers drop, and it has a lot to do with um, the awareness and the education of the fentanyl crisis that's going on. And one, addicts and uh, users and people being more aware of Narcan and um, uh, possessing that and ministering it. And um, so that's where we're seeing the, the, the numbers going down. And that's some of that, some of the numbers that are, are, are shown there. I don't see the 2023, I, that's probably like an old slide, I apologize. But uh, you can see the bottom, um, the deaths are in orange. Uh, 2020, we had approximately almost 20. And then in 2021, Came down a little bit, half of that, maybe about five, and then uh, fentanyl. And then in 2022, um, we had a little, little uptick. Um, and, uh, and it has a lot to do with um, the, the supply and demand with uh, fentanyl. Fentanyl is probably the number one drug being used right now uh, regionally. It's just been, it's, it's been Mexico and the, the cartels are flooding uh, the uh United States and the world with with fentanyl and we'll get into it a little bit because it's just so addictive and it's so um, yeah, easy to get and cheap to buy and cheap for them to make. Um, and then this slide is just um, a slide um, that has the different classes of drugs. So the cards that you have on your um, tables, that has some of them. And you'll see that it has the category of the drug on the top. If you pull the tab out, it has, I think, the physical symptoms, the dangers, and some other information for the different classes of drugs. This is not an all-inclusive slide. Um, I think one thing that I want to point out to here is um, the new class called nitazines. Um, I just got back yesterday from D.C. from uh, one of the largest addiction um, conferences. And um, nitazines are 40 more times more potent than fentanyl. So just when we think it, fentanyl was bad and we have the fentanyl um, epidemic, nitazines are um, a new class that are um, hitting our communities. Um, let me, I think, I, we'll, we'll come back to um, nitazines in a minute. Oh, sorry. My slides are going the wrong way. Um, any questions about these? Yes. Right. Oh. Right. 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 So most people, right, uh, most uh, addicts say that they trust their dealers and know that it's clean. <laughs> but um, you don't know if it's clean or not. Actually, in the back, we have... Um, a sample of fentanyl test strips and xylazine test strips that you can use to test if it's 
if it's contaminated with any of that. So some people know, some people don't know, um, but also these drugs aren't, you know, these are illicit drugs. So it's illicit fentanyl. It's not the fentanyl that the hospital uses, right? So it's made in some remote village um, in Mexico. Maybe, you know, some of the products are imported from um, China. And there isn't a chemist or a pharmacist who's formulating this. So you don't know what's going to be in your cut. So you don't know what's in that tablet. You know, we have a parent in our community who does talks called um, One Pill uh, One Night or One Pill Can Kill You, right? And he lost his son because he tried um, fentanyl, one tablet, and he died. He, actually, he and his best friend tried it at the same time. The best friend survived, and he didn't. So um, I think that was two years ago or nine, huh? Oh, four. Okay, sorry, four years ago, yeah. And it happened right, you know, here in Glendale. Um, so uh, you don't know. I don't well, know. I guess if like, we, a lot of times we don't, when, when they, they say they use the fentanyl, I don't, uh, me personally, I don't think for a first-time user, you're not going to say, oh, I'm going to try fentanyl. <laughs> they probably said, let's try Percocets, which are the, the M30s, the blues. You know, those are obviously, you know, used for a medical use for mental health. And, but they also get they also get someone a high, right? And uh, sometimes, you know, uh, teenagers, uh, uh, college students, um, they want to experiment. They want, you know, wh whatever, for whatever reason, they, uh, peer pressure, their other friend is doing it. Let's try it see how we feel, and, you know, they seek out, they're not going to go to a doctor and get it because they're not going to get prescriptions. So where do they go? They go into the black market. They go find a street dealer who's, who, who claims they have them. They're clean. Yeah, they're doing But not even that street dealer knows if the, that these M30s are clean. You know, obviously, he's just, that person just um, has them to, and want to sell them for what? For them to make money. So they're going to sell them to whoever they, whoever comes up to them and asks them. So for them, they're thinking they're taking a Percocet when in, when in, that, when in reality they're taking a, a, a pill that has, it could be 100% fentanyl, it could be a half, it could be a quarter. Nobody ever knows, again, because they're not being manufactured in properly through, through a chemist. They're being manufactured in, in villages and in jungles and in, in, in warehouses in Mexico where they're just mixing all these, the fentanyl that's coming from you know, a, a, another country, and they're just making them and pressing them and making them in bulk and shipping them and because they just want money. They want to make mass production and want to make money, the cartels. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, yeah, they, they probably were experimenting with M30s, and they got, they're unfortunate, they got that hot dose, and they, they got that one pill or half a pill that was um, too much for them, and they overdosed. That's one reason, yeah, because it's highly potent, right? And uh, the high is higher, at least for a short period. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about now mixing other things with fentanyl to make that high last longer. There's financial so, reasons as well. Right. It's, uh, I'm, I'm Detective Rolando. I work with uh, Detective Rolando. Um, there's also some financial considerations. Um, it's cheaper. They buy the... They typically buy the fentanyl from China in bulk gallons, mostly from China or, or some other areas, but mostly come from China. And it's just cheap. It's synthetic heroin. It's synthetic opium. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot easier to buy that to go to Papa Payans in Mexico and, you know, manufacture the heroin that way. They can just make, you know, they can bank it up. So there are some financial considerations why it's fentanyl on top of, you know, the, uh, the physical Then I, I have this slide here, and I think we have maybe a good representation here. If we can just take a few minutes to talk about, you know, the cultural perspectives on addiction. I know I asked earlier, but I, I do want to highlight, you know, how we have cultures that are more uh, collectivist cultures versus cultures that are more individualistic. So, you know, for example, some of the 
uh, like Native American tribes, right, can see like um, using um, herbs within their community, within their tribe, as a form of camaraderie, as a form of connecting and being together. So, and then other cultures that are more individualistic may have a very different perspective on that. Um, I know, for example, like for the um, Korean culture, right, we have a lot of, um, a lot of focus on saving face and keeping the family honor and how important that is. Uh, and so we see our kids or our family members as extensions of us. So what happens to them happens to the entire family. Um, and so it's important to keep that um, in mind when we're, you know, when we see somebody who's going through the disease and, you know, faced with the challenge of addiction. Um, I don't know. What, what, what different cultures do we have in Durham? Can you, is there anything you guys want to add or say about that? I just yeah. Kind of to piggyback what Carol was saying, I come from a Cuban Hispanic culture, uh -huh. and my immediate family, thank God, we don't suffer from any addiction. However, my extended family is. I lost a cousin; she overdosed on fentanyl. Um, her dad's an addict. It's back and forth. My cousin, other cousin. Um, so I don't. I, Without looking at the data and just going off, right? You know, being alive for forty-eight years, <laughs> um, I don't know. If there may be some cultural, you know, some cultural right. stuff, but I think just addiction really has no boundaries. It just mm -hmm. impacts everybody. I agree. That's just my yeah, opinion yeah. from doing this for for a while. Um, it doesn't discriminate. It, it doesn't. It happens to all of us. It lot, can happen it to anyone. A lot to do with it, and I'm sure we'll cover it. Is just just be involved. We're all parents, right? Everyone has kids here. I'm assuming. Um, be involved, like pay attention to your kids. And not only your kids, pay attention to who they're hanging out with. Right. That's, and I just speak from a parent. I'm not a doctor. I'm not, you know, we've been officers for well over two decades. And as a parent, I have a almost 11 year old boy. I, I, not, you're not hanging out with that guy. I'm sorry. You're not. Right. You're not right. Talking to him or him or her, I, they just, it's a road. Like, I'm just being straight honest. I mean, that, that's a telltale sign. You know, right. be involved in your kids' lives, grab their phone. That's your phone, not theirs. Um, right. It's just not, it's not even an issue. You know, talk to them, see what they're watching, all their right. social media. They shouldn't have social media, none of that stuff. My son, we monitor. You know, we can't. It's unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to look at it, it's the times. You know, iPhones and iPads is kind of how they communicate. We used to communicate on bikes and <laughs> when I was, what, maybe pagers? I don't even remember back then. Now it's just, I mean, they have to be in tune with technology. However, with that said, I would definitely limit their exposure in front of their phone. Mm -hmm. My personal experience, and again, this is not data based, this is just from what I've seen being there. It's across all boards. I've seen single moms whose kids we investigated a death here a few years ago. I handled the narcotics part of it. Um, it was a single mom. She did not, she didn't appear to be an addict to me. She was actually just a decent, she was like one of us, like normal, normal American, you know, and her, her husband had failed. Um, I've seen, yes, I've seen broken homes where you can tell there's going on, you can just tell. You walk into the house, it's dirty, it's not well kept, dad's not around. Usually there's, I think a dad has a pretty big, but I would say one of the common denominators in most people is there's no dad. Or at least it looks like there's no dad, you know? Um, and again, I'm just going off the top of my head. I'm not, uh, I don't mm -hmm. log this, but in answer your question, yeah, like no dad. But on the backside, sometimes it's not, it's, it's just a perfect family. Uh, my best right. friend's uh, sister overdosed. Great family. She's in Philadelphia, partying, mm -hmm. a college student. We all partied. I, I did. I never did drugs, but I drank. And, you know, you don't know what you're taking. Yeah, take this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Passed. She was not a drug addict. She was not a bad person. She was a college graduate. Her parents are straight as an arrow. She was a good kid. She just, fortunately, some people make one stupid mistake and it costs her a lot. 
and her parents' life's gone too. They're right. destroyed. They're done. And they, they never recovered. How shameful. Right. You had a question, sir? Oh. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move forward with the slides. We have um, a lot more slides to go through. Um, so these are some of the things that we want to look for. Some, not again, not all, but some signs that um, can um, help us figure out that something's not okay. And you're the ones who spend the most time with your kids. So, you know, you want to be mindful when these things are happening more than usual, right? So if you're, you're dealing with teenagers, some of this is expected, right? He, you know, isolating a little bit or not having as much motivation. But again, um, not just what the usual is. This is a bit out of the norm, right? So feeling a lot of agitation, a lot of irritability, kind of being all over the place, um, not participating in family events, not just once or twice, but kind of trying to find, you know, a way to be, to get out of um, things that you would usually do together as a family. Um, acting secretive, right, or suspicious, um, not giving you access to their friends, not giving you access to their phone, um, sudden changes in their friend groups, in their hobbies, um, and then if, you know, seeing a lot of resistance when and if you start to communicate with them um, about maybe things should change. Um, has anyone seen any of these things? Teenagers. Which ones? Right. Yeah, middle school. The D.A.R.E. program is no longer... Um, right, but the D.A.R.E. program, right, is only saying just say no. Right. It was something, yeah. I don't think it's... Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, oh. He said he stopped smoking. And I think oh. that's what we're good. And that's why we're here. We're trying to yeah. obviously get get it, get back into that. Not necessarily uh, create our own program. Well, well, we are, but I'm saying not something on the dare. But we're trying to get. Uh, get back into the, the proactiveness of uh, drug education awareness. I know that the uh, Chief Sid is a very uh, big supporter in the organization, big supporter of, of substance abuse and mental health and, you know, getting that word out. So I think slowly but surely we're, we're yeah. getting to that point. Um, we, me and Sona and I and my partners have, have been to schools and we've been to Red Ribbon um, Week, week and, and talked to um, high school, middle, middle school, kids gradually but at the same time 
you know, it's, it's a touchy subject. Obviously, they, we don't, there's, there's a lot of hesitation on, on uh, nowadays of, of uh, either teachers or principals wanting to uh, talk, have their kids is exposed to that or talk about it. But I think it's a, it's, it's a good, it's a good to, to have conversations about it, to make, to make them aware and let, them, let the kids know that we know all the things that are going on and what they're seeing and hearing, especially on social media. So uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're gradually, you know, getting there and hopefully we could uh, do something like right. that. Because you know, I know, I, I remember. And sometimes in those vapes, right, and and sometimes they look like USB drives, so the teachers won't know, and they have marijuana oil in there, so it has THC. Um, but you know, uh, we we had we used to have a lot more um, school resource officers who were you know we had them in all the schools. Unfortunately, we don't anymore. We have a, a school liaison. Um, who kind of covers um, all the schools. But I know that even recently he had a bag of vapes that he collected from all of our schools. And it wasn't just high school, it was junior highs. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you had a question. STAR program? Uh, yeah, I think we still have the STAR program. We also have the Young Explorers program. Um, we have the, it's called Youth Empowerment Program. So there's different programs that GUSD and the Glendale Police Departments have, uh, some in collaboration, some within each um, organization. So yeah, if if you want more information, definitely. Oh, he was okay. Was it helpful? Okay, okay. Thank you for telling us. Um, uh huh. Oh, how nice. The star oh. program. That's with the sheriffs. It's with us. It was with us. Was yeah. it? Okay. Uh, I know we had the okay. PAL program. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. oh. oh, nice. And he's now a police officer. Oh, very nice. I'm glad it helped him. Yeah, thank you for telling us. Um, going back to what we were saying about signs to look out for, these are also just a few more things for you to be mindful and aware of um, in order to identify when someone um, has some resistance, right? So if they're trying to justify their behavior like, oh, I need to do this so I can study more. I, if I don't drink, then I can't function. If, you know, it's not as bad as Joe, you know, I'm only drinking one day a week. It's not like I'm drinking every day. So those are all signs that the person is resistant to change or has some ambivalence to change. So just keep this in mind. Um, I wrote this question here just to see um, what you guys have choose as the answer. Um, what do you think is the right answer here? And this is about fentanyl, and we're going to go into talking about fentanyl from here. You can just say it out loud. E, right. It is E. The right answer is E. You're right. <laughs> So it's all of the above, right? Um, okay. Tonight. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Let me go back. So here we have a video for you. Um, on fentanyl. 
Tonight, we now know how long one of the drug dealers charged in a fentanyl overdose to kick death that claimed the life of rising rapper Mac Miller will serve behind bars. Ryan Rivas in federal court said he was merely a middleman and had no idea the counterfeit oxycodone pills that he gave another dealer were laced with fentanyl. After Mac Miller's mother read a heart-wrenching statement in court, a judge sentenced Rivas to nearly 11 years in prison for the death. Mac Miller is, of course, one of thousands killed by fentanyl in recent years, and the numbers only continue to skyrocket. In fact, more than 100,000 died from the drug during the pandemic alone, and they are still counting the dead from that period. The victims are young, old, rich, and poor. This crisis is impacting communities across the country. Tonight, part one of a new ABC News Live series of reports that will run over the next few weeks. Our Bob Woodruff and team have fanned out across the country to see the crisis firsthand. His first stop in our series, Poisoned, is Nashville, where he learns what makes this drug so powerful. 911, what's the exact address of your... I just came to shoot on my son. And, uh, he's in here, uh, sitting on the couch and he ice cold. I need the police and ambulance. His dad opened the door he started screaming like i've never heard anybody scream before what's your son's name <laughs> okay. my son romello marchman was killed through fentanyl poisoning did you have any idea what could have caused this at that time no um I had no idea what fentanyl was. The truth is that very few have ever heard about fentanyl. Fentanyl is a complete game changer, 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. In the first 18 months of America's COVID pandemic, a record-shattering number of Americans died from drug overdoses. And we are still missing months of data. But we do know that most of those deaths involved fentanyl. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. While fentanyl has gotten growing attention in the world of music, Prince died of a drug overdose. Fentanyl. Rapper Mac Miller found dead with fentanyl. And in Hollywood, Michael K. Williams found dead in fentanyl-laced heroin. It's now in your backyard, coast to coast. Fentanyl has become the norm here in San Francisco. Just my agency has seized enough fentanyl to kill the entire country. It is hitting every neighborhood. Upstairs? Get a pulse? Does she use narcotics? Spring breakers rush to the hospital after taking cocaine laced with fentanyl. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know. <clears throat> yeah, so part of the reason we, back in, uh, again, like I said, in 2021, um, we started seeing a very high uptick in, in fentanyl. When I first started here with the, with the narcotics detail in 2012, the main, the main drug that we were seeing and still see um, is methamphetamine and specifically here to Glendale heroin. Black tar heroin and brown, brown powder heroin was very prevalent here in Glendale. And um, we were having a lot of, lot of uh, heroin here down in, in Glenda, South Glendale and uh, up in La Crescenta. You know, there was, in 2012, I remember, when I, when I was working the special enforcement detail, we were having a rash of uh, vehicle burglaries, um, uh, thefts, and they were a, tr they were, uh, a lot of, to do with the, the young crowd up there, the teenagers that got hooked on heroin. You know, it just took one person to... to Try it, um, go down to um, South LA, Alvarado, MacArthur Park area, and these are these are from stories that we've that we've that we've heard talking to them, um, where they would purchase it and they found out that you know it was a they were addicted, it was lucrative, and they would buy in bulk or they would invite the dealer to come over here and and they had a high clientele, and that's how they got a lot of the uh, teenagers in in La Crescenta and then Tahunga. Sunland addicted, but now we're dealing with this game changer fentanyl. Um, 
that's pretty that's 90 probably 95 percent of our work is all fentanyl we i it's rare that we see heroin because it's just being flooded by the cartels you know obviously the the hub the the hub is going to be la county uh california where the drugs are being manufactured in in mexico by the cartels they're being smuggled um like you see here um in, in colors being disguised as Skittles, candy, um, they they this they apply uh, colored dye to these pills in order for them to be packaged to be smuggled across the border and then being dis, uh, out here distributed into um, different regions all across the country. <clears throat> so this next this next this next call um, is an actual. Overdose death here in, in Glendale. Uh, it happened a couple years ago. It was um, a local teenager that um, my, my, me and my partner uh, dealt with as a young kid. Um, got into some trouble, smoking cigarettes, smoking marijuana, possessing marijuana, thefts, vandalism. Um, always constantly going to his house because he was just, just one of those kids that was troubled. Um, Obviously, as we progressed in our careers, uh, so did he. Obviously, he progressed in his drug use and ultimately lost his life um, through a fentanyl overdose. And this is the actual 911 call of, of that day. So again, we we put the, we add these these slides and these uh calls so we can uh, not scare you but to let you know and make you aware that it's here you know that we shouldn't close our eyes to it and think that in glendale there's no drugs because there is you know just a little quick backstory on it he that that gentleman there had overdosed a day uh, two days prior i believe he was admitted to the hospital as for an overdose was doing drugs with another friend of a friend of his and he checked himself out of the hospital and the doc against doctor's orders and instead of going home and and trying to recover what did he do because he's an addict he's a he's, he's he has a disease uh he went back and bought some more fentanyl used with that same friend his friend lived his friend is still alive to this day and unfortunately he passed that case i could tell you was treated as a as a suspicious homicide our homicide detail responded to that uh, because of the parents found out that um, there was some suspicious phone activity or text messages on the son's phone that led them to think that they knew where the drugs came from. That's where we came along. I investigated the, the narcotics end where we identified uh, a potential dealer of where the drugs came from. We did surveillance. We investigated that person. Uh, we ultimately arrested that that individual with another another guy where we recovered a a large amount of methamphetamine, I mean, um, fentanyl, uh, firearm. We, our, our, my investigation uh, resulted in with collaborating with the uh, Robert Homicide. Um, we found out that he was not the dealer. He was actually the friend that was doing drugs with him. So it's unfortunate. It's it's uh, it's unfortunate how they could use the same drugs. One gets that hot dose and and passes away, and the other one doesn't. seeing a lot of drugs evolve so um, just like we were talking about how illicit fentanyl is made we now have xylazine um, or we're seeing more xylazine and nitazines so um, xylazine is a tranquilizer for animals it's not you know it was never approved for human consumption um, but 
they're now mixing xylazine with fentanyl to extend that high. Um, but you'll see in another slide um, what it does to your body. It eats at your skin and goes all the way to your uh, bone. So it's, I, they're all really bad uh, photos. I, I didn't put, I tried to find one that wasn't as bad. Um, that's just one thing, you know, one, one of the photos. So it was initially, you know, it was created in 62, um, and it was, in, the intention is, um, you know, for veterinarians to use to sedate animals. So like, then large animals, elephants, cows. Um, but they use it, you know, to mix it. And this is how xylazine is spreading now. So you see we're in it, um, where California is here. Um, and um, this is actually from the conference um, this week. And one of the presenters made a really good point that this pattern of how it's spreading is mimicking what we saw for fentanyl 10, 15 years ago. So it's it's a bit um, scary. And like, like oh, I sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, like I mentioned, oh. California is usually the, the hub for the cartels because it's the, the closest border to Mexico, right? Mm -hmm. So they, the large majority of the drugs are being transported from Mexico to California, um, mainly Riverside, San Bernardino, Los Angeles County, um, where they have obviously uh, cartel members or organizations um, that here that are answering to the cartels. And then from there, they get distributed all mm -hmm. over the all over the country and that goes with every drug um, even like marijuana meth heroin cocaine mm -hmm. um, that's that's pretty much how the uh, distribution is going on yeah and also just to keep in mind that all these numbers are usually underreported numbers so for example for xylazine um, not every coroner's office has the ability or tests for xylazine when they have an overdose. So we don't know if somebody who dies from a drug overdose actually had xylazine in their system. Um, and there aren't, you know, now we are getting um, test strips to test for xylazine, just like we had for fentanyl. So those are also in the back if you guys just want to take a look at it. Mm. This, these are just some of the effects of what xylazine can do, right? So you have slower heart rate, low blood pressure, um, decreased perception of pain, which is not good, right? Sedation, muscle relaxation, a lot of potential for infection. So a lot of these patients go into the hospital and get have a lot of complications. Um, this is a slide that maybe, um, did you want me to go back to the other slide? Yeah, sorry, here you go. So maybe some of you know, because uh, I know some of you are in healthcare here, but every prescription bottle has on their label a description of the pill that should be in that bottle. It has the shape, the color, and details of what that tablet should look like. So it's always good to check that because what we also know for uh, prescription medication is that sometimes, right, you have um, family members who are prescribed a pain medication, a narcotic, and those pills get taken or get replaced by something else. So it's always good to check what's in your um, prescription bottle. Yes, Narcan, so that's a good question. Not really, not really, right? Because it, it, it's uh, anesthetic for um, animals. It's not in the opiate family. But again, um, we do have, an, uh, we're not going to talk so much about Narcan today just because of time. But, um, you know, we know that what we always say is, if you don't know what the person has used, 
but you see signs of an overdose, Narcan is safe to use. So, and sometimes one dose of Narcan isn't enough, right? So it's better to use it than not to use it. So on the sleep side of stuff, a lot of drugs get sold online. Cap Chad, um, Opera, Craigslist, Let It Go, a lot of these sold online. New one is called Telegram. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is how it's advertised. Um, balloons for sale, a heroin balloon, uh, roofing costs, like black tar heroin, from $65 a gallon to $65. Things of that sort. Soft clothes, $30 why they would sell the balloon is because the sellers, the runners as they call them, would carry a sock full of a bunch of these things. And as the officers would show up and arrest them, they'd swallow the balloon with water and they'd just leave the rest. So they didn't want to get arrested. They didn't know that he was carrying it until he took it to the hospital and told them what happened. So that's why you that we see local street dealers, major cartel guys, um, over the hills don't like to come to Santa Monica. It just gets hot, you know, it gets the law enforcement get very proactive, you know, the police get involved, and the guys just leave the place. Do not hurt the police, they do not hurt the police. However, we still see police. Mm -hmm. So we try to lure them into like the that's even harder. We don't want them getting in there. But we're out there trying, but we're it's an uphill battle.
add something to another another thing that one of my partners just went through a tra training class is a, a reading habit it's called telegram something similar to to, to uh, the offer up where you're you're pretty much on a on an app and you put your location and you order up anything you want you want to order marijuana meth percocets uh, painkillers fentanyl meth, any name anything you can think of all you got to do is hit them up obviously they're they're going to want you to, to show verify you're not with the police and everything but once you get over those humps they'll deliver it to your to your front door and um a lot of the thing a lot of the, a lot of the training that we've attended and people that have lost kids through this is they said that one thing was is that be aware of what your kids are doing if they're walking out if they're like hey wait late night or if they're acting going in and out of the house um, unnecessarily where are you going oh, I'm gonna talk to my friend he's outside like that's a that's a telltale sign like they're that you should go out there and look and verify because they said that yeah there were a lot of drugs are being delivered just like our food is being delivered right it's new age they don't like going in there and going to a substance but you know you can't teach them anything So this is this is a text message uh, from uh, an overdose victim and a friend prior to his uh, his uh, his uh, fifteen year old or sixteen year old that passed away in Rock Hill Center a few years ago. And my partner spoke about it earlier. He uh, he came down to this to speak. Uh, we're just a common common conversation. Uh, he he is and tries to dr I mean drugs like pussy pills pussy pills. Like, oh, I don't really do drugs. I don't smoke weed. I smoke weed. That's it. Ah, okay. Um, with these parents, I get hella shit from pills and stuff. Does that mean I got? Does that mean I care about you and shit? Yeah, I get it. All, all that stuff could be really good for you. Could be could be good for me in all the moderations, but I wouldn't do it if you're already just so you know. You get? And he says, uh, Yeah, I know, I know. I never OD or anything. Okay, but in the long run, yeah, I do. Because all of my friends have OD at one point, but do you, and gone to rehab, I'm not trying to get to that point. But yeah, just to let you know. And then he kind of like sent him his his information and stuff. And then he gives him a text message. He was talk, most likely he was either, yo, can I get 15 leaves? He spoke earlier, 15 leaves are the M30s that, Percocets that um, are the, the most common ones that are being taken in Rock Hill Center. Hey, can I, um, how many, how many perks you got left? He goes, one, okay, say them to me. And then this was a message from a friend texting the, the, the victim, like, I miss you so much. I love you so much. I wish I could talk to you right here today. Go see your mom. I love you so much. And then that's the, the case that my, my partner investigated. I don't know if he wants to talk about it a little bit. Yeah, the Reed case was, I want to say, in 2017. Um, however, he's a 42-year-old girl who overdosed. Um, right at that time, when he's like, I, I, I don't want to say in hiding, but he was coming up to her and she said she died. It was kind of a like twist at the end where he kind of like killed her not with the drugs and stuff. So right around this time is when is when the local police department came in and arrested him for 
far right container has a little black object. It's called a booger. It looks like a booger. It looks just like a booger. Heroin. Um, what does heroin look like? It looks like black tar. It smell like shit. It's a creamy substance that looks like a raisin. Heroin at the end of the paper clip, you put a straw in their mouth, and they have a little bit of sauce. They light the heroin on fire, and they smoke the joint. And they smoke the joint. That's how they smoke the joint. You see on the right, substance. Look at it. Look on that side. Look on that side. It's called Pink Slip. If you have your old school way of shooting it up, you don't see too much of that. However, it's, it's, still, it's still out there. That's just a good old fashioned kind of thing. Hardcore use. That's a really hardcore use for, for different times. And then you'll see this, you know, the track bar and you'll see this on the street. And it's just pink slip. Um, I don't like to say that it's that much pink slip. I think it's like maybe like 20 or 25 percent pink slip. Sometimes it's also in between their toes if they can't find veins. So, you know, sometimes you see people like late at night kind of with their head down, um, nodding. Try to um, inject it in between their toes too, because it's also not as visible. On your middle there, you have uh, medicinal meth pipes. You take you take a little little slip of meth inside that bowl. That bowl has a hole on it. You take the top, you put some meth in there, and they light it up. They smoke the joint. A lot of heroin addicts use the meth to just kind of balance them out. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes when they're when they're balanced, they're not smoking the joint. They're smoking a little bit. That's how it pretty much was in the, in the beginning. When we first started years ago, fentanyl wasn't really known as a serious drug until the next level of it. That's kind of what you used to see. You still see that. You used to see them, and I say them, addicts. I don't use the word them very often, but you know, when they see addicts, they'll put the pill, they'll somehow put that pill, they'll use the, that same meth to take the pill. Just smoke the heroin in between. You get a hot dose. Those pipes in the middle there are, are being sold in your local smoke shop. Yeah. Smoke shops that you see around here, they advertise them as oil burners. I personally never seen them burn, burn oil, but um, they, they advertise them as bur oil burners, and you see them going in there. So if you start seeing any of that stuff, you're very behind the eight ball. Your right. child or whoever has that in their room is a full-blown brain. Because of they advertise it as an oil burner, and it they it it has a, a legit function to to it. That's why they can get away with selling it. Okay. Just like back in the day, they used to sell crack pipes were like little four inch crack pipes. They used to put a little rose in there and sell them at the liquor store. So you would see those. Yeah, like if you put a glass of pipe on a gas station, you put a little rose inside. A crack addict. Okay. Yeah. Stuff like that. They, they take the flower out and now they have the crack addict. So they, they advertise them as a JIT use, but they're ri we all know what they're really used for, and that's the way they get away with it. Mm -hmm. And then these are just some resources um, that can be helpful, um, some websites. There's also, um, you know, a phone number um, called Never Use Alone. So some people who are a bit more ambivalent or are still trying to figure out whether they're ready for recovery or not, they call this number and let someone know that they are going to use just in case, uh, you know, they overdose. So um, there's an English hotline, a Spanish hotline. Um, these are just some references um, about addiction, recovery in books, in film, um, the book on the bottom is a really um, powerful one, the one that we've been using, um, which is High Tide, but it talks a lot about trauma and addiction. Um, and then 
I know we didn't talk about um, Narcan today. Uh, we do at, at during other talks, but um, Narcan is used to reverse the effects uh, of a opioid overdose. It's available uh, at our local drugstores like CVS, Rite Aid. It's now over the counter, but um, you can also get it online. Yes, Venice. Right. Perfect. Fentanyl testing strips. And Thank a you. Lot of you. A lot of our users, a lot of even our drug users, that uh, we actually went to court on today on one of the local drug dealers that we got, ended up getting in North Hollywood. Uh, grew up in Glendale. We've arrested him hun like countless times. And he himself had a large dose of fentanyl that he was packaging inside his kitchen. He had his own little um, uh, drug, what is it called, proper gloves, sorry. Uh, and proper gloves, he had masks, and then he had a bunch of uh, Narcans in there because they know that they, they, they touch it, they touch their nose, they get a hot dose, and they don't want to die either, right? So you want to sit down? Do the uh, Narcan. They, they, they know they don't want to die. They, they administer it to themselves, and that's why we see a lot of, like, uh, overdose deaths are going down because they're administering it. Because they're able to. Yes. That's all. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Any um, other questions before yeah. we close? Feel yes. Free to look at the, the yeah. Wall. We're trying. <laughs> We're trying. I know that um, I think. Um, on the 31st, we're going to go to CB High School um, during lunch. We're not going to do this talk, but just we're going to have a table um, to give them some information. At Roosevelt, we have a, we did a talk uh, last year. This year, we're going to talk about vaping. Um, we, there are efforts, whether, you know, it's across all the schools. You know, it's a work in progress. Um, but it, there's there are definitely efforts. So, you know, we did this event for parents. Um, it's great that you guys are here, and hopefully, you know, I think if there's one thing that you can all do today is at least tell one person about what you've learned from here, um, and hopefully we can reach more and more families. Right. 